Well, good afternoon and welcome to Deep in Scripture. This is Marcus Grodi, your host, joined by my co-host, Dr. Kenneth Howell. And uh, we've been working through the, the wonderful epistle of Romans. And uh, if you're joining us for the first time, uh, I would love to invite you to go to the website, uh, deepinscripture.com, where you can listen to the previous programs. We'd love to have word from you, your thoughts about uh, what Ken and I have the audacity to say when we're studying Scripture. Uh, and uh, we'd love to have your thoughts. Our goal in this program is based on a conviction that our apostolate has, and that is to become deep in Scripture and deep in history is to help you become deep in Christ. And that's our goal for this program. Uh, we try to begin each program with an email that we've received in the interim, and we'd love to hear more from you. And uh, we did receive an email from Connie, and <clears throat> this connects with the, uh, the day that this program is first broadcast on All Saints Day. And, and she writes, with All Saints and All Souls Days coming up, where in Scripture is there any foundation for praying to saints or praying for departed souls? Uh, and she says thanks. Uh, thank you, Connie, for your email. Uh, Ken, you know, that would have been a question that you and I probably would have had way back when, when you and I were both Presbyterian pastors, if we had the audacity to be hearing Catholics talk about All Saints and All Souls Day. You know, Because in our churches, when this weekend arrived, we weren't thinking about All Saints or All Souls. We were thinking about Reformation Sunday. Yeah, that's true, yeah. Yeah, because we were thinking about liberty from the Catholic Church. <laughs> At least uh, that's what I was thinking about. Yeah, Exactly. Um, in fact, and, uh, I remember on my Reformation Sunday weekends in my last Presbyterian church, which I thought was kind of strange when I look back, the, the church was actually quite large. Uh, it was a long colonial size, size construction. And in the front of the sanctuary, there was a table for communion, and there was a big cross, and that was all that was in front, which is typical of many um, non-Catholic worship spaces where they want to avoid any kind of statuary. But on the other hand, on the side walls of the sanctuary were three, or six, excuse me, three on each side, large stone relief portraits of Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, Bucer, John Knox, and I forget who the other one was. And I, I you know, here we were celebrating Reformation Sunday, and I'm pointing to these great uh, reformers and <clears throat> avoiding any discussion of saints or all souls, because that's a Catholic thing. We Presbyterians don't talk about that. At the same time, there we had the, the images of the reformers that were the foundation to our Presbyterianism, and that always seemed a bit controversial or contradictory to me. Did you have anything like that in your church? Uh, well, I would agree. That is a little bit strange. I mean, we we had our saints, we, and we called them saints in the sense that everybody else we thought was a saint. But uh, in any case, it was a good experience. Um while it lasted, but at the same time, <laughs> I, what it showed to, to me was that uh, uh, there was something more to be to be worried about. I think the real difference between the Protestant and the Catholic is that, in that regard, is that the traditional Protestant, like you and I were, we we honored these people, but we didn't have any real sense that there was a connection between heaven and earth in which they, through their prayers, could help us, or we through our prayers, can help those that are still on the journey, but uh, left this life, but still on the journey to heaven. Now, certainly that latter point, we we certainly denied vigorously, right? Because that yeah. undermined salvation by grace through faith, we thought. Um, I don't think it really does, but that's what that we thought. And, um, and so the idea that the saints were in heaven praying for us was something rather strange indeed. Yeah, and I... I don't know that I would have denied that as a pastor. I would not have addressed it. And and it really, in many ways, gets down to the question that, that Connie asks, and that is, show it to me in Scripture. Where is it in Scripture? Because there was that assumption that uh, 
And there's a difference between kind of the Lutheran branch and the Calvinist branch because both were sol are sola scriptura based, but it seems to me in my Lutheran background, uh, it was more, well, if scripture says you can't do it, you can. Whereas the Calvinist view, if scripture doesn't say you can, you can't. It, yeah. it, there was a more limiting yeah, factor true, in the yeah. Calvinist perspective. Um, whereas Lutherans, you know, there are St. Luke churches, you know, Lutheran parishes. Um, sure. So there was sure. not as much of an anti-saint emphasis in the Lutheran tradition as there was in the Calvinist tradition. And I, I think the issue comes down to, before we address the question, where is it in Scripture? This sounds like I'm avoiding the question, but really the bottom line is that the number one question is not, where is it in Scripture? That's immediately like setting the stage based on wrong criteria. Um, and, uh, you know, just to back off a bit, that the divine scriptures that the Holy Spirit inspired the writers, Peter, Paul, James, John, Matthew, Luke, Jude, you know, that uh, these were a, a written part of, sacred tradition. And we see this expressed in 2 Thessalonians 2.15, when St. Paul says to stand firm on the tradition uh, that you've received, whether orally or written. They're both the sacred deposit of faith that our Lord Jesus passed on to his apostles, who then through their preaching passed them on. Paul said in Romans chapter 10, how can a person uh, have faith or believe unless they hear, and how can they hear unless someone preaches, and how can they preach unless they're sent, and that word sent is the same word that we get the word apostle from. So we see this underlying presumption that the, the truth of the Christian faith was primarily and initially and continues to this day as this living passing on of the truth of Jesus Christ through the preaching of his apostles. And there were times, we see this in the history of the early church, when Paul and Peter or John were unable to travel to be with the people that they'd already converted, that they'd already delivered the faith through their preaching. We see this in Ephesus and Colossae and in Corinth. They already believed in Christ had accepted Christ, surrendered to Christ, were abiding in Christ through the preaching of the apostles long before they received the letters that they had received from Paul at Ephesus, Colossae, Philippi, Thessalonica, or Corinth. They are already believers. Uh, but this written uh, kind of a correction, if you will, most of the New Testament letters are corrections to problems going on in churches that Paul has to do this because he's in chains and he can't get there. So he writes, and that's why he says in 2 Thessalonians that this tradition of our faith is passed on both orally and written. Now, the reason I, I address this, Ken, with this question is that when we want to understand the tradition of, of asking those who have gone before us that we recognize as martyrs or saints, asking for their intercession, or also, on the other hand, offering prayers for those who have already died, that we don't just look to Scripture because the authors of Scripture may not have been addressing that issue because of the problems in local churches. So we look to the wider tradition, and when we look to the wider tradition, we see this long-standing tradition that goes back to the Jewish tradition, is witnessed in the second book of Maccabees, is witnessed to in the book of Revelations, and then particularly is witnessed to in the writings of the early church fathers. Well, pointing us back to the pre-Christian, that is the Jewish tradition, is important, I think, because I remember when I was in college, I uh, went to a Jewish uh, synagogue service on, on Friday nights uh, for a few months uh, as I was trying to learn some basic Hebrew. And I went there mainly to, to learn the Hebrew, but I heard them praying for the dead. And I thought, oh, well, that's certainly one of the differences between <laughs> between Christians and Jews is that <clears throat> they pray for the dead and we don't. Their practice uh, 
which became standard part of, of Judaism, is based on uh, a text that we as Catholics accept as authoritative, and that is the second passage in Second Maccabees 12. It's speaking about those who are getting ready to die. Uh, Judas is the man, a man uh, one of the Maccabean brothers, and uh, he won't offer the sacrifice to the pagan god. And so what he says here is that um, he took up he took up a collection, <clears throat> uh, man by man, to the amount of two thousand drachmas of silver, and sent it to Jerusalem to provide for the sin offering. In doing this, he acted very well and honorably, taking account of the resurrection. For if they were not ex- if he was not expecting that those who would follow would rise again, it would have been superfluous and foolish to pray for the dead. Now what does he do? Well, then it says, he, for if he was looking for to the splendid reward that is laid up for those who have fallen asleep in godliness, it is a holy and pious thought. He made atonement for the dead, that they might be delivered from their sin. This is a recognition that <clears throat> uh, people die, but they're not yet perfected. So you make atonement for them by offering the sacrifice, and this is exactly what the Catholic fathers of the church did when they talked about the Eucharist as being the sacrifice. If I might read just very briefly, this is from a 4th century bishop, Bishop of uh, St. Cyril of Jerusalem. And he says this um, in his Lecture 23, Catechetical Lectures, we commemorate those who've fallen asleep before us, patriarchs, prophets, apostles, martyrs, that their prayers that at their prayers and intervention, God would receive our petition. And by the way, notice that. They're not in the place of God. That's through them that God receives it. That's an important distinction for us as Catholics. Afterwards, also on behalf of the Holy Fathers and bishops who've fallen asleep before us, and in the word of all who in the past years have fallen asleep among us, all in the past year have fallen asleep, that's All Saints Day, or All Souls Day, Believing that it will be a very great advantage to the souls for whom the supplication is made while that holy and most awesome sacrifice is presented. In other words, exactly what Maccabees was saying. Here it is saying, okay, we offer the sacrifice of the Eucharist, Christ himself, to cleanse those who have sinned. And this is a holy and pious thought, it says in Second Maccabees. You can see in, in even the writings there, Ken, that you quoted um, from Cyprian, right? That was Cyprian, right? There's also yeah. a quote from Cyril. Which Cyril, you know, that was Cyril. That was Cyril, Cyril. okay. Yeah. Um, that, was, that was Cyril, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> the, the reasons that Luther would have been uncomfortable with all of this, and therefore, though Second Maccabees was a part of the original canon of Scripture back in the late 4th century— and became the foundation for all Bibles, Catholic and Orthodox, all the way through the 16th century. Why Luther would feel uncomfortable with this, both because it emphasized the church and it emphasized sacrifice, which Luther was uncomfortable with, Mm -hmm. comfortable with, and uh, the priesthood he was uncomfortable with, and therefore, Maccabees was witnessing to all of these things, including the intercession of the saints. And therefore, you know, that was a re- one of the reasons why he reduced the Old Testament down yeah. by the books that he did. Well, and I think it's also the fact that this is clearly pointing to the need for purification of our lives, and not in just an illegal declaration of righteousness, but in fact a righteousness that is given to us from Christ, but actually makes us pure and righteous. And that's inconsistent with the doctrine of justification by faith alone. That is the idea that there's a legal declaration that makes us acceptable to God. The ancient tradition was the ancient teaching based upon Scripture, based upon Second Maccabees and then all these other texts that are in the New Testament, is it not, are we declared righteous, but we must be transformed into righteousness. And that's why the doctrine of purgatory makes perfect sense on a Catholic understanding of salvation. 
but makes no sense on a Protestant doctrine. If you accept the idea of a legal declaration of forgiveness, and that's all that's really necessary, then purgatory is superfluous completely. So it, it's consistent, at least, with, him, with his own premises. But his premises, I think, were wrong. I remember an experience. One of my sons and I had been working out in the in the barn, and and it was we, it was uh, it might have been Thanksgiving. So there was uh, there was a big feast that my wife had prepared for us, and we were all getting ready for it. But my sons and I had had to go out to the barn, and by the time we came back to the house, we were covered with manure. And I can tell you, my <laughs> wife was not going to let us into the feast unless we first. <laughs> yeah completely took off everything we had and cleaned ourselves <laughs> to the skin yeah. right and uh, yeah. and you know and she was even being a bit persnickety about it to the point where we were almost having to be cleaner than we had ever been before in our lives but uh, <laughs> she wanted to make sure <laughs> but my sister-in-law was up there interceding for us trying to help her tell her you know <laughs> cut, cut them a little slack here they're cleaning up the best they can. And, you know, to me, that was a funny model of, you know, we're, we're waiting to get into heaven, but we're covered with manure, as Luther said. Yeah. And uh, but before we can enter into the feast, we need to be purged. We need to be cleansed. And in the process, there are saints yeah. up there interceding for us on our behalf. Uh, I mean, yeah. you know, there's the family. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's Absolutely. the family. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cut him a little slack. Of course, uh, the problem <laughs> there is that God doesn't cut a slack because, but what He does cut is, is a Savior who gives us yeah the righteousness. He already cut us the slack, which we're yeah. talking about in today's passage. Yeah, uh, and today's right. passage deals in Romans chapter six, verse one through fourteen, deals with the issue of sin. Uh, now that we've been saved by grace, it deals with sin. But it particularly deals with baptism and what baptism has done for us. We live in a day, Ken, when a lot of Christian traditions don't even think baptism is important anymore. I mean, Ken, what what do those traditions do with Romans chapter 6? Well, it's it's interesting. There's a it's kind of an odd, I don't know, it's it's almost paradoxical. Let's just take, for example, the Baptist tradition. Now, we have all these different types of Baptist churches. The biggest one is, I think, still in the Southern Baptist Church. And it's got something like, I don't know, 12 or 13 million members uh, throughout the United States. Uh, They have missions all over the world. And the Baptist tradition goes back to uh, the very early part of the Reformation with Menno Simons and, and so forth, where they didn't baptize children. What's interesting about it, though, is that they insisted that a person had to be baptized once they were a believer, and that any baptism prior to a confession of faith in Christ was not was not valid, was not legitimate. So, for example, if you were baptized as an infant and then you became a Baptist, then they wouldn't have recognized that earlier baptism. So they stress the importance of baptism. But notice what they stressed. They didn't stress its meaning. The meaning is that it unites you mystically to the body uh, of Christ on the cross. That's what Paul's talking about here. But in their thinking, baptism is totally a symbol. It's only a profession of faith so that others can see that you've become a Christian. It's not. It doesn't have any real spiritual power to it as the Catholic Church believes. And and they would look at Romans 6 and affirm that the benefits that a Christian receives through baptism, which we'll look at in a moment, they would emphasize that these come through faith and faith alone, as Luther would have exactly. emphasized, yeah, not baptism words, per se. Well, exactly. I mean, because they have a nominalist view of of the, of the sacraments. In other words, the sacraments are just the occasions which bring grace because of faith. You mentioned and, the word Calvin, definitely. You mentioned the word nominalism. Nominalism. Define that, because I really yeah, do. Yeah, That's yeah. absolutely key to understanding what ended up as a flaw in theology. 
Yeah, and this is a, a good point. Um, nominalism was a philosophy that developed in the late Middle Ages, particularly associated with William of Ockham. And then there was another theologian named Gabriel Briel, and he was Luther's teacher. Luther's teacher, teacher right. And, uh, yeah, and uh, Luther adopted this idea of nominalism. And nominalism, it's a very complicated philosophy, but basically the point is this, that physical things are only physical things. They don't convey spiritual realities, all right? And that's exactly what modern evangelical Protestants believe, that you, the physical world points to God, but doesn't embody divine things. And this is why the Catholic understanding uh, or for Orthodox, for that matter, uh, of understanding of the sacraments is very difficult for them to understand because the Catholic Church's teaching is based upon the idea that these physical things embody, they are conduits for the spiritual. So, for example, um, the, bab- the water of baptism is a water that not only symbolizes but conveys the forgiveness that Christ won for us on the cross. In other words, the reason that the Eucharist is the body, it's not just a symbol of the body and blood, it is the body and blood. Uh, When a priest declares forgiveness in the confessional, uh, when he absolves the sinner, the penitent, it's not just that he's a man acting like Christ, he is acting in the place of Christ. So he's embodying Christ's authority in doing that, but that's what's that's what's difficult for a nominalist to uh, to believe. All right, Ken, thanks a lot. Because I I remember when I was on my journey of discovering the Catholic faith, I read a a, a wonderful book by uh, a, a convert by the name of Bouillet, uh, and the book is called nice. "The Spirit and Forms of Protestantism," which I highly recommend uh, because it's a very ironic presentation of the truths that Luther and Calvin and the other reformers were trying to bring about and emphasize the goodness of them, but sadly where they went too far in emphasizing any Mm -hmm. one of their emphases and the damage that it has done to the entire Christian tradition by emphasizing one thing too much, faith alone too much, or Calvin's sovereignty of God too much. And the reason in their arguments, they were, yeah. Bouillet was pointing out that this the philosophy of nominalism, and I didn't even know what it meant when I was reading it at that point, how, how crucial it is to understanding some of the flaws uh, at the core of, of mm-hmm. some Protestant theology. Um, if you Let's look at Romans 6, 1 through 14, and uh, we'll be taking a break in a little bit, but what I thought we'd do before the break is I'd like to read the passage for those of you that either don't have scripture in front of you. Uh, uh, But also, if you can, I encourage you to go to the website, deepinscripture.com, and look at the diagram that Ken and I have put together because it's a way of taking that paragraph and trying to uh, visually show the argument that Paul was using as he presented to the Romans dealing with this issue because he begins with a question— And then he has, in verses 2, 7, 11, and 14, basically four answers or axioms that are based on an uh, an understanding that they already have about the meaning of baptism, which you see in verses 3 through 6, and then also in verses 9 through 10, uh, a belief that they accept about our Lord Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. And at the ends of verse 4, 5, 6, 8, and 11, I'll, we'll go through that in a bit, he not only emphasizes the, um, what has happened to us, what has changed in us as a result of our baptism, but the benefits that we will and should experience because of what Christ has done for us through his death and resurrection and what we received as a result of that in baptism. And then finally, in verse 11 and on, we see the kind of the results of his, of St. Paul's argument, kind of the therefore, in verse 11, particularly what we must uh, accept about ourselves, and then in verse 12 and 13, what we ought to do 
the difference it should make in our lives. That's kind of the overarching argument. Let me read the passage, Ken, and then maybe before we take a break, you can you can address the question of why would St. Paul feel compelled to address this question at all? Let me read. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self is crucified with him so that the sinful body might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For he who has died is free from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Found for we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let not sin reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. Do not yield your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but yield yourselves to God as men who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. See you in a bit. Hello, I'm Marcus Grodi, the host of this program, and I'd like to tell you about my newest book, What Must I Do to Be Saved? A growing number of Christians today believe that all that is necessary for salvation is an individual's faith in Jesus. Churches everywhere proclaim this Jesus and me theology based upon a simple interpretation of John 3.16. They diminish the need for rituals, sacraments, creeds, or even membership in any particular church. But is this true? In this book, I examine how salvation has always come by being a faithful individual in the family of God, the church. For information, please go to chresources.com or call 740-450-1175. Thank you. What do all these have in common? A former agnostic, a fallen away Catholic, and a once upon a time Protestant. Find out next time on The Journey Home. Marcus Grodi invites pilgrims from all walks of life to share how they made it home to the Catholic Church. The Journey Home, only on EWTN. The Journey Home is seen and heard around the world on EWTN. For dates and times in your area, log on to EWTN.com. Deep in Scripture is brought to you by the Coming Home Network International. We are a network of inquirers, converts, as well as lifelong Catholics helping one another grow closer to Jesus Christ. On our website, you'll find conversion stories, articles, and videos, as well as information about becoming a member and receiving our CH newsletter. Visit chnetwork.org or connect with us on Facebook or Twitter. Welcome back to Deep in Scripture. This is Marcus Grodi and Dr. Kenneth Howell. And we're, we're looking at Romans 6, 1 through 14. I tried to read it all in just before the break, and uh, well, I, I didn't get verse 14 in, Ken, but we'll bring that in for our conclusion today anyway as we close up. But this whole passage deals with the issue of sin and continuing to sin after we've been baptized and put our faith in Christ you know, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. In fact, John even says it stronger in his first letter, chapter 3, when he says, no one born of God commits sin. For God's nature abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. And we know in the context of all of John's writing that when he uses born of God, he means Baptism. 
And we see that affirmed in Justin Martyr. When Justin Martyr talks about being born again, he's, he's saying specifically baptism, what, what brings new birth. So this issue of continuing in sin after we've been made new in Christ. So my question to you, Ken, is why does Paul feel the need to address this issue with these Roman Christians? Well, in a sense, the answer is very clear from verse chapter 5, verse 20. He says that when the law entered, uh, he said the law entered in that the transgression might increase. But then he says, or might abound. Then he says, but, but where sin abounded, grace superabounded, abounded all the more. Now, <clears throat> if... If when we were living in a state of alienation from God, God sent his son into the world, brought the grace of God into the world through his life and, and uh, death and resurrection. If, if we are in our state of sin, were able were the objects of God's mercy, well, then I suppose we should continue on with our sin. And we should uh, giving, become more sinners so that we could get more mercy. That's the objection that Paul is now answering. So, so he begins with this typical phrase that he uses in a number of places in his writings. He asks the question, so what should we say? What's the conclusion of all this? Maybe we should continue in sin uh, so that grace may abound. Well, he said, no, that's, that's impossible. But now what's interesting is why it's impossible. It's impossible because continuing to sin is inconsistent with the sacrament of baptism. That's the, that's the point I think he's really... That's the basis upon which he's appealing to them to live this holy life. Remember who you were, who you are. You are baptized into Christ Jesus. Ken, I'm wondering, I, I didn't think to look at this in preparation, but often in Scripture, the word abide, the Greek word for abide is translated in a number of different ways, as continue, as remain. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, is, yeah, the, right. is the Greek word here, are we to continue in sin, is that also connected with that word for abiding? It, it is. Uh, the, the normal word, at least that John uses in his gospel, is the word minnow, like, just like we say a little minnow. Minnow means to abide. But this is a stronger word. Uh, this is epimeno. And now epi is like a, like in the word epipen or eponymous and so forth. It's the word upon in, in Greek. And so it means, shall, it's like a, it strengthens the meaning of the word. Shall we just, you know, stay deeply embedded in this sin? That's what Paul is saying. He's saying, is that the kind of life we should live in order that... And I think, by the way, there might be an implicit... Um, and there may be an implication there that it's it's the recognition we do sin as Christians, but the question is, are we going to continue or abide in sin? And maybe that's what John was talking about in First John from the text you read. In other words, he's talking about not someone who sins, but, but who has the, as a word, the occasional sin, but the person who is living deeply immersed in sin. And he's making no attempt to overcome it. I think that's what Paul is saying here. We talked about this at an earlier episode of this program in that uh, too often many Christian traditions that have been influenced by the faith only or the once saved, always saved idea that what is emphasized is the initial entrance into Christ as if that's all that matters. And once by faith or even by baptism, you've, you've entered into union with Christ, then you're saved. And what you do for the rest of your life doesn't matter. We have that, that statement by Luther that at some point he says that he could commit, a, a, adult, commit adultery 10,000 times in one day and not lose his salvation. So they only emphasize the being in Christ, the entrance into but we talked about that really the, the long journey with Christ involves a, a journey of stages, of conversions, multiple changes where you begin by being in Christ through faith and baptism, but then you're called by grace to continue to abide 
in Christ. It's a constant turning in his direction for the rest of our lives. And then what happens in the process, we're also growing in the third stage, which is growing in charity, in love, in joy. And it's a constant movement in that direction. And there's always that temptation to turn away, as we see in Hebrews chapter 6, that once you can, you've tasted of the Spirit, you can turn it all away. And so the danger is that we don't continue abiding in Christ. Instead, we continue abiding in sin. And in fact, last, I think it was last Sunday, or, or uh, I think it was last Sunday's epistle reading from Ephesians was addressing the very issue of telling people to quit living in immoral lifestyles yeah. because one cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven if you continue living and having these attitudes, continue sinning. You, you're in Christ through baptism and, and you've been changed, but that doesn't necessarily guarantee that you'll remain living in that context. Well, that, that's exactly right. And so there's in, in Ephesians 5 has all these, uh, you know, list of vices that you can fall into. And Paul says in no uncertain terms that the person who does will have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. I'm reading from Ephesians 5, 5. Uh, so and if we look at not only the world today, but even the state of professing Christians I think one of the, the conclusions you have to come to is the, the complete relevance of what Paul is saying. I mean, there are people in positions of religious authority today who are simply out and out advocating immoral behaviors. Now, it's one thing to commit a more moral behavior. That's just you committing it. You haven't influenced necessarily anyone wrong. You can always repent of that and be forgiven. But when you stand up in a pulpit or in a place of religious significance, and you proclaim that horribly immoral things are okay or moral, you're not only hurting yourself, you're hurting all of those who hear you. Paul is not in any way uh, shy about saying these things are sinful. Now, there's, 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 all, and there's also another reason. It's in that passage there for us in chapter 6 of Romans. You know, Paul emphasizes that Christ died the death of the cross once. He was taking on the battle of sin. And he, def he dealt the definitive final blow to sin on the cross. Paul says that's our model. Through baptism, we're connected to that definitive defeat. Now, what we have is we have the lingering influence of sin in our lives. So what should we do? He's saying you need a personal transformation. Consider yourselves as if you were dead to that. Now, in chapter 12, Paul's going to later on speak about um, one of my favorite uh, passages in the Bible where he says that you, could, you, should, uh, you should be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And not be conformed to the spirit of the world. To be a baptized Christian is to set yourself over against the world and its evils. So Paul is saying in Romans 6, just as Christ once died to sin, so you have now died to sin. Look at your life that way. But the positive side is that Christ doesn't live just once. He lives forever. And so our life is forever in one of obedience to Christ. Excellent. Ken, the, if, if the underlying question of this section of Scripture is, can we continue in sin somehow so that grace may more abound, trying to come up with some positive, you can hear the devil whispering behind people's sincere but wrongly, I mean, you're so true, Ken, that this is so addressing today because a lot of these bad theologies out there are well-meaning people. You know, I mean, it's. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was exactly. thinking that one of the absolute keys to growing in faith and intimacy with Jesus Christ is suffering, is the necessity of denying mm -hmm. ourselves and picking up our cross, 
of, of sharing in the suffering of Christ. That's absolutely essential to growing in Christ. But Ken, that doesn't sell very easily. And it's hard to fill basketball <laughs> arenas with people with that. So instead, well-meaning preachers preach a health and wealth gospel where there's no suffering, there's no sacrifice, there's nothing yeah. but blessings. We're new in Christ, and if you love Jesus, he loves you, and you think the more you give, the more he'll give you. Yeah. I mean, that sells and that fills arenas, but it ain't true. Yeah. And that's what Paul is cutting down to the oh. quick here. He's cutting through these well-meaning people, but they were wrong. He answers it with two axioms, which are in verse 2 and 7. For by no means, how can we who died to sin still live in it? And then 7, for he who has died is free from sin. So there's the foundational truth. We have died. The old is gone, the new is come, yeah. as you'll say. But someone might say, well, 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 wait a second. How did I die to sin? Wait a second. When? When did this happen? Ah, uh, yes. yes. Uh, what, what do you mean I'm yeah. dead to sin? You know, it still tempted me here, but when did I die? And that's when he then has to remind them of what they already have been taught. And that is the meaning of baptism, Ken, in its outline there in verses 3 through 6. Well, the way that he's asking the question here, don't you know, verse 3, or don't you know that those who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Those, uh, by the way, we, we read from uh, Cyril, uh, Cyril of Jerusalem, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, the 4th century bishop of Jerusalem, from his catechetical lectures. It sounds like Paul here is taking the people back to their catechesis yep. prior to baptism. In other words, he's saying to them, hey, don't you remember that we talked about baptism as a dying to sin and a coming to new life? You know, Ken, I, I that reminds me of, why. I was just going to say, Ken, that reminds me of what the writer of the Hebrews, doesn't the writers of the Hebrews have to say, you know, guys, let's leave the elementary doctrine in Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation yes, of repentance and, and, and from dead works and of faith towards God with instructions about ablutions and laying out of hands the resurrection of the dead and the eternal punishment. I mean, he's saying, guys, move forward. But here Paul is saying, okay, let's go back to step one again and remind you of what your baptism has done for you. Yeah. And, you know, this is so important when we think about it. I've been reading a book lately about the founding of the American Republic. And one of the things that the author, Matthew Spaulding, makes here is that we have lost a sense of what it means to be an American. We've gone to school, we've done all these things, but people don't know the foundational principles of our Constitution and of the founding fathers of our country. Now, by analogy, what Paul is saying here is, look, have you forgotten the foundational principles? The foundational principle is that in your baptism, there was something real given to you. What was given to you? It was the grace of Jesus Christ, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the goodness of Jesus Christ, and that was what re rescued you from sin. Now, how can you think about going back into that? In other words, the freedom that Christ gave us in baptism is the freedom to live a good and holy life. That's the foundation of our life, is our baptism. In one sense, our baptism should never, never be forgotten because it's what united us to Christ. Just one final point on that. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas says, that all of the sacraments have their effectiveness in the cross of Jesus Christ. In other words, what makes the sprinkling or the, or the baptism or the immersion of a child or adult in water, is it the physical act? Well, remember, it is the physical act because that has to be there. But it's the spiritual joined to the physical. And when the two are joined together, united together, Forgiveness flows from Christ's cross and his, his resurrection. Excellent, Ken. In three, verses 3, 4, 5, 6, and then in 8, he first, in each of those verses, he begins with the truth about baptism that Paul assumes they know is not up for grabs, not up yeah. for questioning. 
He says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Verse 4, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Verse 5, for if we have been united with him in a death like his. Verse 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the sinful body might be destroyed. And then verse 8, but if we have died with Christ. Now here's my point. This is what's happened. The old is gone, the new has come. We've been baptized into his death. We, as he said, united with him in death. We know that our old self was crucified with him. Hey, Ken, that reminds me of another place where Paul was talking in Galatians 2.20, where Paul admits to himself, for I, oh, yeah. through the law, died to the law that I yeah. might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me and the life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, that was an important passage that I always mm. preached on and remembered but the connection is that that doesn't just come merely through faith, but it comes through our baptism. The importance of that baptism. Yeah. Yeah. And then those, you know, you he, he builds on those, those things, Ken, those truths, and then from those truths that we assume, there are also those, those truths that we need to claim as the reality of who we are and who we can be by faith and hope in Jesus Christ. Well, it seems it seems to me that uh, what Paul is, it, you rightly emphasized that there's two senses in which we are united with Christ in His death and in His resurrection. On the one hand, before we were ever born, <clears throat> the Lord Jesus Christ had His had us in mind when He died upon the cross. He made the sacrifice of His own life to the Father for us, but. Obviously, not being born, uh, in, it didn't benefit us directly. But baptism is the connection. It's like a conduit. It's like a, a secret electric wire where the, the electricity, the power of that cross is then infused into our souls and then transforms our minds from being uh, slaves to sin to being alive to God. Now, you notice, there. I want to point back, if I may, uh, just to verse 6 for a moment. You read this, and in the version that you read, I think, which is the RSV, yep. it says that we know this, that our old man was crucified with him, and you pointed us to Galatians, and that I'm crucified with Christ. It's our old man. It's that sinful nature, which is crucified, put on the cross, and then it says that the sinful body might be destroyed. Um, <clears throat> the literal translation of this is more that the body of sin might be. Um, now, it is possible. That is a possible translation linguistically, sinful body. But I wonder if Paul maybe really does mean here the body of sin. And when, when he uses the word body here, he doesn't mean it in the physical sense. He uses it mean like uh, in the way that we use it when we use the expression, the body of law. We mean an abstract group of ideas or laws, right? And so what he's talking about here is the body of sin is that whole collection of sin which dominates our old man or our old self, right? He uses the word anthropos here. That you never, in the version you read, it's translated self, right? It's trying to get away from the man part of it. But anyway, it's our old man, and this man carries around this this body, this collection of sin, and that's what Christ came to destroy. Why? So that we would no longer serve, it says, so that we might no longer be enslaved. I like that translation. Might be enslaved to sin. That's what true holiness is. That's what true freedom is, is to not be enslaved to sin anymore. Now, Ken, I'm going to throw this onto your plate, a um, bit of a curveball. But in the midst of these passages were verses that I used to use for the once saved, always saved. And if you're looking at the, um, uh, the printout, uh, 
you'll notice that I've got some verses that are colored text. And in verse 4, the second half of it says, uh, we too might walk in newness of life. But the end of verse 5, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. End of verse 6, and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. And then in the second part of verse 8, we believe that we shall also live with him. I used to make the distinction that verse 4 and 6 talked about the possibility that for the rest of this earthly life, we might live a different kind of life. But I also emphasize that verses 5 and 8 emphasize, on the other hand, that surely, certainly, because of our belief in him, we shall live with him and have a resurrection like his. Do you see the argument? I don't know if you used that before, Ken. No, I'm not, you're saying that you... I made you a distinction be. between verse 4 and 6, where verse 4 and 6 seem to emphasize the earthly life after our conversion to Christ that we might, by grace, live a different mm -hmm. life. But on the other hand, verse 5 and 8, the way it's worded, at least in my translation, seem to emphasize a certainty of the future salvation mm -hmm. and resurrection in Christ. And my question is, does the Greek mm -hmm. allow for that? Now, I would argue that there's the danger of sola scriptura, taking some verses and making too much out of them, apart from the bigger context of the writings of Paul, which he certainly doesn't emphasize the once saved, always saved, or that we can be absolutely certain that we're saved in resurrection. But taking those verses, do you see where I kind of ran with that to emphasize my once saved, always saved yeah. theology? Well, it's important to realize that in verse 5, in the RSV that you've put out here on the sheet, it says, we shall certainly be united with him in the resurrection like his. And the word certainly does not occur in the Greek. Oh, now, interesting. the reason they put it in, and it, it's, it's, it's not that it's unjustified completely, because the tone of the, of the statement is one of certainty, right? But here's what it says literally. If we are buried with, we, if we are buried together in the likeness of his death, so also we shall be in the likeness of the resurrection. That's what it says. It doesn't say certainly. Uh, it certainly doesn't say certainly, but it does <laughs> say, but, but, it does, but it does imply a, a sense of confidence. Right, so I think that there is both. That in this is the point you made about soul of scripture is really important. About you, you can take a, a verse and you can distort it. You can push it out of a, out of all proportions, like a caricature, right? That you make a comic strip with. Um, in the same way, this verse does give us confidence of being in the likeness of Christ's resurrection, but that doesn't negate the fact that between our baptism. And that final resurrection, we have an awful lot of holy living to do. And if we don't do that holy living, our final salvation is very much in doubt. Um, but it does give a confidence that we're moving toward that as we seek to live holy lives. And that's that theology, theological virtue of hope that Paul talks about in many other verses, mm. many other of his books. Faith, hope, and love. The hope um, and in this passage, just in conclusion, this is the truth about our baptism, the truth of what baptism has done for us because of the death and re resurrection of Christ. Therefore, verses 11, 12, 13, and 14, he challenges us to therefore be alive to God in Jesus Christ, to not let sin reign in our mortal bodies, to not let our members, our eyes, our ears, our arms yield to sin, but yield instead to God, that our members may be an instrument of his righteousness, because sin has no more dominion over us, because we are dead to sin, because of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Thank you, Ken, my friend, for joining us today. And all of you, thank, thank you, you for Marcus. joining us on this episode of Deep in Scripture. We're looking forward to joining with you again next week. We pick up with 
Romans chapter 6, verse 15. Again, go to deepinscripture.com to find out more about our apostolate and our program. God bless you. See you next week.